session as of July 1st of this year. Um, Virginia has the distinction of being the first state in the South to make a number of progressive policy inroads, including today being the first state in the South um, to green light uh, cannabis three years earlier than had initially been uh, proposed. So big implications for criminal justice um, and uh, what a perfect day for, for this event. To gather, to, to think about Virginia, it's incredible policy progress under the current blue trifecta and the importance of keeping that trifecta this year and to explore and celebrate the year round organizing and advocacy by New Virginia majority that has laid such an important foundation for those electoral successes that have built such progressive power in Virginia. So I'm Gabby Goldstein. I'm one of our co-founders here at Sister District and our Senior VP of Strategic Initiatives at Sister District Action Network. Um, I don't wanna take too much time, but I wanted to set the stage briefly for the events agenda. So first, I'm just gonna give a really brief overview of Sister District and our State Bridges program. Um, thank our incredible host and co-host teams, and then I'll turn things over to them. They'll spend a few minutes introducing themselves and their teams, and and then introduce our guest speaker, Tram. Um, Tram will then tell us a bit about New Virginia Majority and the landscape in Virginia. And then we'll have time for some Q&A with Tram, which I'll moderate. And friends, this is a fundraiser for New Virginia Majority. So during our program, our host teams um, will take a few moments along the way to provide opportunities for you to contribute. So a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first, we have closed captioning, um, and we'll paste the instructions into the chat for how to access the closed captioning. Um, second, if you have questions along the way, feel free to throw them into the chat. We may not get to all of the questions during Q and our Q&A with Tram, but we'll do our best. So let's dive in. Uh, at Sister District, for, for anyone on the line who might be new to us, our mission is to build progressive power in state legislatures. My co-founders and I started this organization in late 2016 because we saw a gap in organizing capacity and resources going specifically to building progressive power at this level of the ballot. And we are tardy to the party. Uh, the Republicans have been uh, weaponizing state legislatures for decades, using these chambers as laboratories for regressive policy. And we really wanted to turn that around and focus on building state legislative power because these chambers are our policy pipeline, our leadership pipeline, and they're such important, vital keys to fair districts and voting rights. Um, so how do we do it? How do we, how do we build progressive power in state legislatures here at Sister District? Well, our strategy has a few pillars and they include winning elections, of course, as well as supporting local organizers whose year round power building in their communities in those states makes those electoral wins possible. So on the electoral side, among other successes, our 50,000 volunteers across the country um, I, were so proud to be part of the coalition that helped get really close in 17 and then ultimately flip both chambers of the Virginia General Assembly in 2019. And we know that those electoral wins were made possible in no small part because of the consistent year-round organizing work of New Virginia Majority and their sister organizations across across Virginia. And that's where State Bridges comes in. So of course, we've seen in, in recent years what we've known all along, which is that progressive victories are possible when we collectively invest in and lift up local power building organizations and the activists that lead them. So State Bridges is a new program that gives us and our volunteers across the country the opportunity to connect with and fundraise for organizations doing that important year round power building work in states where we're eager to build state power in the legislatures. Because we know that long term community based organizing, often led by people of color, is bedrock 
for our ability to build progressive power in states. And so this program is an important complement to the electoral work that we do as well. So we're so proud to support this long-term year-round organizing that makes building progressive power in state legislatures possible. And we could not have a better partner than New Virginia Majority for, for, for the program and for this inaugural event uh, with, with Tram joining us, who's been an incredible leader in Virginia for so long and whose work is absolutely essential to this mission. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and thank our amazing team hosts for the event, Sister District California Peninsula and Sister District New York City. And I'll turn things over to Chad Horner, um, who is our co-captain um, of our New York City team. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Gabby. Uh, yeah, just a quick introduction. Uh, my name's Chad. I'm one of the leaders of the New York City chapter. So we cover both uh, Manhattan and Queens over here in New York. Um, I slash we have been organizing and volunteering for campaigns in Virginia, Pennsylvania, uh, and North Carolina over the past four cycles. Uh, and so, you know, really excited to, to be here, part of this event, supporting a great Virginia-based organization. Uh, and so I'll pass it over to uh, the Lisas in California now. Sorry, I was muted there. Thanks, Chad. Uh, Lisa, I'm Lisa Rosenthal. I'm one of the co-captains of the CA Peninsula chapter. We're um, a very strong chapter uh, in Sister District. And I'm here with my co-captain, Lisa Diaz-Nash. And I think mm -hmm. Catherine Grenman is also on the call, our, our, our other illustrious co-captain. Uh, our chapter stretches from south of San Francisco uh, down the peninsula. And uh, we've been working um, now it's what, five years on a variety of campaigns, Virginia, uh, Texas, uh, and Pennsylvania, uh, so many states, I can't even remember them all. So we're they're very happy to be a, a co-host uh, tonight. And uh, I want to thank also all of the other um, host chapters that have really contributed to this um, event. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you. We have over 100 people on the call tonight, and we've already raised a significant amount of money. And so we're glad that you're all supporting this great initiative um, for Sister District. So now it's my great honor to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, and uh, that is Tram Wynn, and she is the co-executive director of New Virginia Majority, and she's been there since 2008, since the beginning. Uh, she leads New Virginia Majority's civic engagement efforts, which have touched over 1 million voters of color. And Tram has been at the forefront of this organization as it helped shift Virginia from red to purple, to blue in 2019. We were all so excited when that happened. And in the coming years, she's going to continue to work to protect the state's democratic majority and advocate for progressive legislation at the state level. And she's gonna fill us in and talk about some of the incredible work that New Virginia Majority is doing. Um, the organization itself started 12 years ago and it had, as it says on their website, the audacious goal of building a block of conscious, consistent voters to advance a new brand of politics that is democratic and just. Um, they're on the ground where we as sister district volunteers can't be as we're here stuck in our little Zoom screens. Um, they're there, they're engaging with voters on a personal level, uh, not just at election time, but throughout the cycle. And they continue once candidates have been elected to lobby them on significant issues. Um, Virginia would not have turned to blue without New Virginia majority. And so we're very excited uh, for the work that they're doing. And uh, we, am sh we are, confident that they're going to continue to engage voters and bring success in 2021. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Tram. Thank you, Lisa. And um, thank you all so much for 
for being here tonight and for the important work that you are doing and the role that you play in the national movement. Um, it's such an honor to partner with Sister District and uh, this new Sister Bridges program. I wanna thank Gabby and Lala for your leadership in building such an incredible organization with chapters across the country. And I wanna especially thank the Sister District New York City and Sister District California Peninsula chapters, Betsy and Chad and the two Lisas for co-hosting um, the event tonight. It's, it's been over a year since the COVID, pandem the COVID pandemic hit. And in that span, we have lost hundreds of thousands of lives due to the coronavirus. And we've lost countless more lives due to unnecessary violence. We've witnessed and experienced the summer of marches and protests against police brutality. We saw the toppling of relics of the nation's racist history. Um, and we saw the not so peaceful transition of power. And we've also seen a rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans like me. So if you're like me, it can be overwhelming at times. And there are days when it's easy to lose sight of why we are in this movement and why we do the work that we do. So I actually would encourage you all to pause for a minute, um, close your eyes and think about how you got here, how you became a part of this progressive movement. Um, for some of you, it, it was natural. You were born into the movement and for others, you took a complicated journey to, to get here. Um, but I'd love for us to just reflect for, for a second. So for me, here's where my journey begins. 40 years ago, my mom and dad left everyone and everything behind in Vietnam to pursue a more just and equitable life. Um, from the moment they set foot on that boat and navigated their way through the rough waters of the South China Sea, they had a dream that propelled them to keep going despite all of the challenges that lied ahead. And that dream was America pure and simple and the promises of freedom and equality and justice that she holds. 40 years ago, my parents weren't even sure that they would make it here to this country safely, let alone imagine that the daughter that they gave birth to in a refugee camp would one day grow up to be one of the fiercest defenders of their dreams of America. And, but shaped by my experience of racial profiling and discrimination, growing up as an immigrant in the South, I have always envisioned myself one day playing a role in creating a new world where we all belong. So in 2008, I helped start an organization called New Virginia Majority with the purpose of organizing and engaging new Americans like me, black and brown people, young people, working class folks uh, to form a new majority, a new power block in, in our great commonwealth. And 10 years ago, very few believed that as a bastion of the South, Virginia could be a protagonist in the story of a more just and inclusive democracy for America, and that we could potentially lead the way for progressive victories across the country. Because let's face it, as recently as 2013, Republicans had the trifecta. They controlled the office of the governor and both chambers of the General Assembly. We were on the defense. Districts were drawn to intentionally pack black voters into a handful of, of districts to dilute their voting power. And they were drawn to heavily favor Republicans. We were working against all odds. But some of us dreamed the seemingly impossible and, and local organizations like mine have always understood the political potential of Virginia. So for the past 14 years, we have organized and reached voters of all colors, women, low-income workers, young people, meeting them where they are, and that's really important. The year-round organizing has allowed us to develop a robust base of support and to expand the electorate to be more reflective of the Commonwealth citizens. This includes registering nearly 300,000 new voters 
and knocking on over 3.2 million doors and talking to voters about the challenges that they face every day. Not a transactional relationship, but a real authentic relationship in creating political homes. And so through the work of not only my organization, but also our, our partners, um, both in state and national, and volunteers and supporters like you all across the country. For the first time since 1993, Democrats now control all bodies, all governing bodies in the state after the sweeping elections in 2019. And Sister District, you all were a part of that. Those elections were just a step on our new path for Virginia because we all know that elections are never the finish line which is also why the Sister Bridges program is so important. And your role as supporters of state-based infrastructure and power building is so important because you all understand that this work is long and hard and requires steady and ongoing support. And it's, it's already making a difference. As Gabby said earlier today, we became the first state in the South to legalize marijuana three years earlier than what the General Assembly initially intended. In the last 18 months since those 2019 elections, we have made generational progress in Virginia. When most of the country is trying to restrict the right to vote, moving away from our democracy, we are running towards it full steam ahead. We have expanded access to voting by allowing anybody to vote by mail who wants to. We have, um, you know, establish a 45 day early voting period, the longest uh, in the country. I think Minnesota is the only other state that has that. We repealed strict photo ID requirements. We established automatic voter registration, same day voter registration. We got rid of Lee Jackson day um, that commemorated Confederate soldiers and replaced it with election day as a state holiday. And today we also just passed the comprehensive state voting rights act the most comprehensive state voting rights act in the country that would really protect um, our right to vote. We've made meaningful improvements in our criminal legal system that include prohibiting law enforcement from using bias-based profiling. Uh, we mandated the collection of data to include use of force. Um, we removed the mandate that law enforcement report to ICE anybody that they have in custody. We uh, passed Breonna Taylor's law banning no-knock warrants. Um, as mentioned, we legalized marijuana and we became the first state in the South, you're gonna hear me say that a lot. We became the first state in the South to abolish the death penalty this year. Our attorney general is empowered to investigate and prosecute suspected hate crimes. We raised the minimum wage. We put in place non-discrimination laws to include gender identity and sexual orientation. We established the first domestic workers bill of rights in the South. Um, we permanently codified the Virginia Council of Environmental Justice, and we established the Virginia Environmental Justice Act. Um, we've done a lot, and that's just a small taste of it. Um, all together, since the start of 2020, after our trifecta, we passed over 165 pieces of legislation that were part of the New Virginia Majority's legislative agenda, and we're not done. These are laws that lay the groundwork for transformational change. But despite our recent victories, we have a long way to go. Virginia, like the rest of the country, is grappling with many crises of our lifetimes. Right now, we are facing not only a public health crisis, but a crisis of our economic, political, and social systems, the very fabric of this country. And with the inability to move much more than stimulus packages at the federal level, although we're gonna keep trying, um, especially with HR1 and, and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the PRO Act and, and all of these things are in front of Congress. We know that right now in this moment, much of the responsibility to tackle meaningful systems change falls on the shoulders of local and state governments. And that's why this work is so important. And I know that across the country where we have a combination of elected officials who are willing to use their positions as vehicles to drive change, along with organizations like mine and community leaders who hold them accountable, progressives are locking in policy wins and improving lives. And that gives me tremendous hope. 
our work is getting started. We've made generational progress. Um, and we've done that because we've had elected leaders who better reflect our communities, who look like us, who are us. And it was possible because voters have been turning out in record numbers, not only in splashy presidential years, but in these off year elections. The 2021 election cycle right here, right now in front of us is no different. It's the first major contest the country has since the November presidential election. All three statewide seats, governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general are up this year, as well as all 100 seats of our House of Delegates where control of the chamber is on the line. And it's a redistricting year. Um, the census data is gonna come in late. So we think and we know right now that our House candidates are gonna run on existing lines and they'll probably have to run again next year. So we're looking at a one-two punch. The outcome of the 2021 elections will determine whether Democrats maintain their governing trifecta. It'll be a test of whether we can hold on to our victories and maintain this forward momentum, or if we're gonna revert back to 2013 when Republicans controlled the governor's seat, the House of Delegates. I mean, put simply, the outcome of 2021 will determine whether we can continue to make progress and be that vanguard for the South and for the country and uh, whether we can continue to play offense or whether we have to revert back to defense. And I'm telling you, I do not want to play defense anymore. This is, it's been too much fun these last 18 months. Um, so it's on us, it's on all of us to roll up our sleeves yet again and get to work. Um, because for those of us in Virginia, our lives and our livelihoods are, are on the line. Um, so like every year with an open heart and, and clear eyes and hands ready to get to work, I. I'm ready and I'm ready to do it with you all. So thank you so much. Pam, thank you so much for your work, for telling us about your journey and for everything that you're doing. It's, you know, it's incredible to hear the, it's the number of bills that Virginia has passed that are part of New Virginia Majority's legislative agenda. Did you say 132? Or 165. So you oh my know, God. Even it's more, like, I know. It's like all pens up and we were just ready to just let loose. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. And, you know, there are issues that you've been organizing around for so, so long and the, the success must be so sweet to, to finally have it. And I know that we're all excited to keep this work going and support you and New Virginia Majority in this mission. So I'd love to turn things over to Chad to tell us how we can contribute. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Gabby. And thanks so much, Tram. Um, the Sister District community, super honored to have you here with us. And I know that the mission of New Virginia Project really resonates with, with our volunteers. Um, Virginia has a really special place in the hearts of a lot of us at Sister District because for many of us, our first involvement with Sister District was back in 2017, helping to elect candidates uh, for the Virginia House of Delegates. In our case in New York, that was Danica Rome, who became the first openly transgender state legislator in the country, uh, and Shelley Simons, who memorably had her race end in a tie and then lost in a drawing of lots, uh, which I still often draw on as an example of the power of a single volunteer action uh, because one voter contact can really make all the difference. Uh, and in that case, it has a happy ending because she ran again two years later uh, and won handily. Um, but while we at Sister District are there when there are campaigns for us to help and races for us to win, uh, New Virginia Majority has been there before doing long-term community-based organizing, civic engagement, getting people registered, all of which makes it easier for us when we come in to assist with Get Out the Vote. Um, and also after we are done acting as an advocate for issues like voting rights and a fair criminal justice system, a lot of the other issues that Tram discussed uh, which you know helps ensure that the candidates that we elected or helped elect actually accomplish what we helped them get elected to do. Um, and you've clearly been effective at doing that. You, you talked a lot about the flurry of legislation that has come through um, this cycle and also a lot of what has happened over the past four years. Um, so I don't need to rehash all of that, but you know all of, all of those accomplishments are why we're here tonight to do our best to help um, New Virginia Project. And so we want to share our resources in recognition of how incredible uh, this organization is and how truly important the work is. And so to really show how strongly we believe in this cause, both the New York City and California chapters 
uh, have committed to match the first thousand dollars in donations that each of our teams receive. So at least a, a two thousand dollar match uh, in total. And so we're sharing links to donate in the chat right now. These are the links of the two host chapters. You can click the link of whichever team you're closest to and donate as generously as you can. Some of you on the call might not be able to donate. Uh, we totally understand that. It's completely fine. Thank you for being here and helping to spread the word. But for those of you that can, I really, really encourage you to do so uh, and to share it with others in your life who, who want to be strategic about their donations, because this is definitely clearly about as strategically sound as it gets. Um, and so now we're going to move to some Q&A with SRAM, and then we'll report back later on what we've raised. So I will pass the imaginary mic back over to, to Gabby. Fantastic. Well, I know that I had so many questions coming out of your talk, Tram, and I know so many folks on the line um, are, are eager to, to, to learn more and, and dig in. Um, quick reminder, if folks want to throw their questions into the chat, um, I'll do my best as we go. Um, uh, and uh, apologies if we if we don't get um, to everyone. But to kick us off, you know, New Virginia majority, we just 160 something bills passed, accomplished so, so much, you know, on the electoral front, obviously on the policy front, voter engagement. Um, if you could sort of pick one great or a couple of greatest hits from this democratic trifecta, uh, it's probably hard to do, but would love your sort of greatest hits on what this trifecta has accomplished. That is a really hard question, Gabby. It's like out of 165 bills, what am I gonna choose? Um, I will say, uh, I rarely, I don't like to cry in public. It is just not something that I have been conditioned to do. And there were moments, um, there, there were a couple of bills and a couple of moments um, in the last 18 months that I have openly weeped uh, uh, when we, we got through. Um, I mean, today, as I mentioned, the Voting Rights Act passing, is just um, has just been like that was a labor of love, right? I you know when we think about especially passing in a state like Virginia, where you know a little over 400 years ago the first enslaved Africans were brought to the shores of this country, and at in that same time period, right, the first representative democracy was founded in Virginia, and how it's taken four centuries for us to finally embrace like what a truly reflective democracy could look like um, by you know establishing the fundamental right to vote here has just been like that entire arc is um is significant um especially given the backdrop of voter suppression um and, you know i think someone mentioned the chat box like medicaid expansion you know making sure that over 400,000 virginians could have access to health care and um, was just a step uh, this year we actually expanded that and said for immigrant um, women and children and, and, and for, for folks here who, I don't know if folks are familiar with the 40 quarter rule, but essentially if you have not lived and worked uh, as a legal permanent resident for 10 years or 40 quarters, you were ineligible for Medicaid regardless, right? And so we just passed that. And so, you know, given COVID-19 and healthcare being such a critical issue, those things are significant. Um, all of our criminal legal reform uh, has been has been, you know, really emotional, met minimum wage. I mean, I just, there, there's just been so many, everything has just been pent up, right? And so we, it's just like, we pass it all. And, and I think when you know that you're passing things that aren't just white papers, things that have been studied and like academically proven to be a sound policy, but you know that the policies you're passing are actually changing lives and they're tangible um, that's when, you know, when you, you're able to step back and say, this is why we do what we do. It's hard. It's long. It's hard. It sucks most of the time. But in those moments, it's worth it. A thousand percent. We had a really great question. Um, really, and you mentioned the new voting rights um, at the state, the Virginia version of the Voting Rights Act, which is so incredible. How does that impact voter registration work? Um, do these new laws reduce the need or change how you approach voter reg, uh, given you know the the, um, the the sort of simplifications or expansions in the ways that people can can register? Yes. Um, one of my mottos, I have, I have very many mottos. One of my things, like when I know success is when I can organize myself out of a job. Um, and so with voter registration, it's one of those things where it's like, oh my God, if we can just organize ourselves out of having to do voter registration, then that is a big victory, right? 
Um, and so we actually don't run large scale voter registration programs like we used to do. Um, in 2016, for example, in that one year alone, we registered over 160,000 people and because it was so needed. And since then we passed automatic voter registration, same day voter registration was passed and will be in effect next year. And so with these things that make it easier for folks to get on the rolls, it means that we've organized ourselves out of having to do that work, right? Um, and it means, and that's, that's great because that means that people are actually getting on the rolls. Um, so yeah, I don't think that we need to necessarily run the same type of large scale voter registration. However, I will say that there are people that are being, you know, that are left behind, right? So if you think about automatic voter registration, you have to have a DMV ID, right? In order to, to, to be eligible. And so think about the folks that um, don't have IDs or are transient, rely on public transportation, they don't need DMV driver's license. Um, we think about people who have their rights restored, who've been sort of outside of the system, living on the edges, right? And so how do we find those harder to reach folks um, and make sure that they are registered and engaged? And so the work looks different, um, but we don't need to run those large scale voter registration drives in the way that we used to. Yeah, which is incredible. I mean, it frees you up to do all of the other work. You know, so there's yep. there's no there's no lack of work to be done. Um, you know, another great question that came through was around um, federal issues and whether uh, grassroots groups like yours coordinate across states um, on on key you know federal pieces pieces of federal legislation specifically for the People Act, which would really give all states such an incredible boost in terms of voting rights. I'm curious how your organization fits into a larger coalition on those cross state issues. Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, we we know 100% that we can't do this work alone, whether that's at the state level or at the national level. Um, so at the national level, we are part of, I'm, I'm sure folks are familiar, especially the one, uh, folks in New York are fam familiar with the Center for Popular Democracy. We are a state affiliate for CPD um, in Virginia. And so when there are some national campaigns, we, we work with um, all of the CPD affiliates across the country. There's also peer-to-peer, -peer, like there are lots of similar organizations um, in states. Um, and you know, the Sister Bridges program has identified several organizations like ours in a, in a number of states. And there's a lot of cross pollination. I mentioned earlier to a couple of folks um, that I actually, you know, back in, in November and December and early January, I took about six weeks leave of absence from, from New Virginia Majority and joined Fair Fight Action down in Georgia and Stacey Abrams shop to run their voter protection program during the runoffs. Um, and so there's a lot of cross pollination. We all work together. And um, again, because we know that we can't do this work alone. And as I mentioned, you know, it's really hard to get anything done at the federal level. Um, you know, we got stimulus packages, but everything else has been really hard. We got to get through the filibuster in the Senate, all of that stuff. And so we do. I mean, we do talk to a lot of organizations and a lot of leaders in other states to try to identify how we can. Um, move our, our, our senators, our US senators and our congressional folks and who has relationships with whom, if I can call up my congressperson to call you know, a congressperson in, in Texas to, you know, like, so I think there's a lot of work that we do together. Yeah, which is fantastic. And, and we love to hear that. It's, I think we feel very much the same in coalition and uh, it takes all of us to, to mm -hmm. taking different pieces of the puzzle to, to get where we're trying to go. And, you know, we have a ton of organizers on this call. Uh, I see we're up to 135 um, folks on this call, which is just incredible. And I know that one of the things that you all do at New Virginia Majority is, you know, have this ladder of enge civic engagement, um, you know, taking folks from inactive active voters to become active voters, then to become volunteers, then to become activists and leaders. And I'd love to hear, you know, we would love to hear what are some of the strategies that you've been able to use to move folks up that ladder of engagement? Definitely something on all of our minds as organizers, how best to do that and what the best practices you've seen are. I mean, I think it all boils down to relationships, right? I think, you know, when we, when we go talk to a voter and we go door to door, for example, um, oftentimes voters are only approached when they need something from a candidate or a campaign. Hey, I need you to turn out you know, on Tuesday to vote for me. And then they don't hear from them again. And so when we have conversations with voters, we're actually engaging them in a dialogue around you know, what's on their mind, what issue is most important to them right now. 
And how do we, you know, how can we work with them to improve that? And yes, a part of that might be voting in the election and voting for, for a particular candidate who might be a champion for that issue. But after November, we're right back, uh, you know, talking to them. We're saying, hey, remember when we talked to you about education and you voted for Skylar Van Valkenburg? Well, he's carrying this bill and the, the session's coming up in January and we need your help again, right? And like, and so people are, it's the start of developing relationships with people that I think is really important. Um, you know, my, my favorite example is in our rights restoration work. Um, we have a lot of folks for returning citizens who uh, for the longest time have not felt seen by anybody, right? And so when we approach folks and we say, that you know, their voice matters, that they need to register to vote and they need to be engaged in whatever it is, a local campaign. And they feel seen for the first time. Some of our strongest member leaders who run their own chapters are returning citizens who, who have said to us, you know, you all gave, New Virginia majority gave me a home where I feel like my contributions are making a difference. Um, and so I think that's the difference is that, you know, these aren't transactional relationships. We are trying to build authentic social homes or political homes where people actually have ownership over, you know, it's, it's that whole empowerment part, right? Um, and I think that that's, that's, that's the, the recipe for success when it comes to organizing. A thousand percent. And, you know, so much of electoral work can be somewhat transactional and it takes the, the truly the year round consistent work of talking to folks about the issues that matter to them, which is the work that you do um, to, to, to complete that circle. Um, so, so that when it comes time to turn people out to vote, they're actually engaged. There are issues that they care about and they happen to know something about the person voted that, that they're voting for or that we'd like them to consider voting for. So um, that makes tons of, of sense. We have um, time for one more question and it's sort of a twofer. I mean, I think that um, you know, none of us know what the landscape looks like post-Trump electorally. Uh, there are certainly some potential challenges in the Virginia elections this year with, com you know, complacency among voters, um, some, you know, kind of problematic data stuff where we didn't really get their data from 2020 broken out all the way and um, all the rest. So, uh, but, but great opportunities as well. Incredible progressive folks running this year. Curious what you think, just in a broad picture, not individual candidates or anything really electoral, but what you think of as sort of the biggest challenges and opportunities going into this, this year's elections? Well, I think uh, that is a really great question. I don't know if we are going to witness the same type of complacency that I typically worry about when I think about an off-year election, right? We're always concerned about that drop-off um, where, you know, people forget um, that there's something really important happening. I mean, we have to obviously do the, do the work, do the outreach and communicate with people and remind them that there is an election this year. But I think the opportunity that we have, and we haven't had this in, in a really long time, is to demonstrate that elections like actually have consequences, right? And that we, we delivered. So, you know, all of these years where we've been saying to, to folks, like, you gotta vote, like, it can improve your life. Like, people do care. We, we can address affordable housing. We can address healthcare. We can address all of these things. And the fact is, in the last 18 months, we have delivered. People are staying in their homes despite an eviction crisis. People are getting healthcare access um, despite this COVID crisis. Can it be done better? Of course, but people are getting, their needs are being met and they're being seen and heard. So I think that that is our greatest opportunity by saying, hey, remember all of these things, like we've delivered and we can continue to deliver, like we can continue this forward momentum, but we have to stay engaged. We cannot let, like, let up right now. Um, I mean, I think Gabby, you're right. This is the first year where where Trump, so to speak, or Trump, it, like it, you know, isn't you know in office and he isn't on the ballot. But I will say that Trumpism is still on the ballot. Amanda right? Chase we, calling anyone Amanda Chase. I mean, Amanda Chase self self you know proclaimed Trump in heels, and and Trumpism, right? We're still dealing with white supremacy. We're still dealing 
with violence. We're still dealing with all of these things. And so people know what's at stake. Um, so I do think that, you know, it's, it's, it's an exciting time for us to keep it going. And I will say like, just full disclosure, we have, you know, the, we, we, there are primaries right, ha right now that are happening and we did endorse in the gubernatorial primary. And so we are out on the doors right now. We are talking to hundreds of thousands of voters right now and they are excited. They're excited, they're paying attention. They know that we have an opportunity to make history here in Virginia. And so I'm not, I'm actually not super worried that we're gonna have like this dramatic drop off where only, you know, 20% of the voters actually turn out to vote and it's like, oh God. Um, so so I, I, I think we're gonna have a good year. I'll I, keep my fingers crossed and knock on all the things. <laughs> I love the optimism. I think, I think you said it exactly right, which is, one of the best things that we have going into this is, is our record, right? I mean, the, the, the things that we can point to having delivered and the concrete ways that these policies have and will continue to make people's lives better. So I love the enthusiasm and the optimism. It is incredible. And we, we want to continue uh, all of this work. And um, friends, again, I would like to remind you again, this is a fundraiser. Uh, so I'll turn things over to Lisa Diaz-Nash to give us another opportunity to contribute. Thank you, Gabby, and thank you, Tram. I don't think any of us need to understand anything more than what you've told us over the past hour. This is why we do this work, and we are here to support you because your work year in and year out is supporting all the candidates. So everyone on this call, I know Chad was very nice but let me be very direct. Thank you so much for everyone who has donated. If everyone can reach into their electronic wallet and pull out $5 more, the, the links for the donations are in the chat. They will be open after the session is over. But as we heard, Tram has got to go out and get people on the road knocking on doors. We all know that is the most effective thing in the world to make a change. And we're seeing the results. There is no state in this country who has made more progress in a shorter amount of time in creating progressive change for real people than Virginia. And it is organizations like New Virginia Majority, it is people like Tram and everyone that works there, all the volunteers. But you all know, they have to pay for office space, they have to pay for Xeroxes, they have to pay for getting people out and we can help them so they can help the candidates. So when we get our candidates, the job is that much easier and so much better. I can't wait for Tram to come back this time next year and tell us about all the additional legislation they've gotten through. So let's all take a chance to just $5, $10. If you've got an extra million dollars, please feel free to donate that as well. We won't turn it away, but every dollar helps and everyone get on your social media and tell your friends about Sister District. Tell your friends about New Virginia Majority. Tell your friends to get engaged. There is no better way to do it. So the, the links will stay live. We will keep going every day, but we just wanna say thank you so much to New Virginia Majority. Thank you so much for everyone who has been here tonight because you are now all deputized. You have been knighted. You are to go out and make that charge on behalf of all this great work that's going on. So we really want to thank Sister District for bringing us all together. And Gabby, thank you for everything that SDAN is doing. State Bridges is a totally new project and we are so excited about it. There are four more events coming up that you will hear about. So come back, participate in all of them because as Tram said, all these groups help each other and together we can help everyone in the United States. So we have also, beside uh, the donation links, uh, we are putting in the chat links for future events. Uh, Chad has put into the, uh, the chat about the New York chapter and what they're doing. We put in an upcoming event that CA Peninsula is doing on the 29th of April. It's with Pro Professor Etan Hirsch, who is a professor, professor of political science at Tufts University. And he's written a book about taking all this power and bringing it into the grassroots and how powerful 
grassroots groups are across the country at making change happen. So please sign up for that event. Please sign up for everything that New York is doing and share your events across the country because we all have to help each other. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Chad and, and, and uh, Gabby, but thank you all so much. This has just been such a great event. And Tram, as she said to us earlier tonight, is wearing her orange, that is their brand. So tomorrow, everybody go out and wear orange in honor of New Virginia majority. So back over to Chad. Awesome, thanks Lisa. Um, yeah, as, as she said, we've got a lot of, uh, we'll have a bunch more events upcoming. Uh, the mobilized links are in the chat to, uh, to see what we have planned. Um, and then also in terms of just an update on fundraising, I think we're nearing um, the, the $13,000 mark, which is really pretty amazing. Um, and that's, I believe before either of the, the matching uh, amounts have been added. So I feel like 15,000 at least would be like a good round number. So at least to 13 pre-match would be good. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it for me. I will stop, stop pestering and pass it back to Gabby. Just want to thank this entire crew. What a fun 47 minutes. I loved every minute of this. I can't believe that we are almost at $15,000 raised for New Virginia Majority. Incredible success. Huge thanks to our hosts, California Peninsula and New York City, as well as our other teams who, who helped promote this event and bring their members. Huge thanks to TRAM for everything you're doing and for sharing with us. Um, all of the work ahead and the work that has already been done. We are here to, to help however we can. Um, and it is our honor to, to, to be in this fight with you. So thank you all so, so much. And um, just really, really grateful again for, for the opportunity to spend this hour with you. So thank you everyone. Have a great thank night. Thank you. Thank you.